Good evening, welcome. My name is Lisa Landrum. I'm the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. I am also the Cultural Events Representative for the Department of Architecture, and that gives me the great pleasure of hosting events like this evening with the assistance of Brandy O'Reilly and Madeline Defoe in the Faculty's Partners Program. So before introducing Roisin Keenahan, I'm delighted to acknowledge that this event is made possible with the generous support and philanthropic vision of the Manitoba Masonry Institute. So over the last three years, the Manitoba Masonry Institute has supported world-class designers and researchers in sharing with us their award-winning work and in doing so, enhancing our regional discourse on design excellence. Past speakers have included John Oxendorf, Billy Tian, and Siamat Hariri. The Manitoba Masonry Institute president, Kevin Dudich, is here to say a few words on behalf of the Institute. Kevin is a technical sales representative specializing in masonry for Brock White Construction Materials. This is part of the Construction Supply Group, or CSG. And CSG, if you didn't know, and I did not before I looked it up, is the second largest building materials distributor in North America, providing quality masonry, waterproofing, and building envelope products to major infrastructural and architectural projects across Canada. Kevin has been a technical sales representative in the construction industry in Winnipeg for over 12 years, and he has served as an executive member of Manitoba Masonry Institute for the last five years, and now serving as president. So please welcome Kevin Dudich. Thank you, Lisa. On behalf of the membership of the Manitoba Masonry Institute, I would like to welcome you all to what has quickly become one of the most, uh, one of the highlights of our year. It is our renewed partnership with the Department of Architecture that has given birth to this exciting new guest lecture series, and we couldn't be happier with a stellar response. We would first like to thank Carlos, Lisa, and Brandy, and their team at the University of Manitoba for organizing this whole event. It is very much appreciated. We would also like to thank our guest, Roisin Hinehan, for kindly accepting her invitation to speak tonight. We are very much looking forward to her thoughts and insights. The Manitoba Masonry Institute is comprised of senior industry members, primarily masonry contractors, manufacturers, and suppliers. Our mandate is to support, develop, and strengthen the masonry industry in Manitoba. We work with key industry stakeholders to develop programming in research and education to ensure we're always promoting state-of-the-art to our design community. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our industry members who are in the house tonight. Jeffrey Dolovich, Gillis Cores Limited. Rob Weeb, Cornerstone Masonry. Norm Blero, Blero Masonry. Paul Duquasquier, IXL Masonry Supply. I hope I haven't missed anyone. We would like to also thank all of you for this wonderful turnout on this beautiful Manitoba frigid evening. <laughs> Thanks to the collaboration of some of Winnipeg's finest designers Masonry contractors, manufacturers, and suppliers, Winnipeg is the location for some of the most significant masonry buildings in Canadian history, including the building we are in right now, the Winnipeg Art Gallery. It is so important to have all the grad students here tonight. Our industry wants to support and ensure that your experience with of them is as meaningful as possible. Our partnership with the Department of Architecture helps connect you, the students, with industry professionals and provide real context. Tonight speaks to this commitment. I would like to thank you all again for coming here tonight and invite Lisa back to introduce our guest speaker. Okay. Roisin Heenahan is co-founder of Heenahan Pang Architects, created with partner Shifu Pang in New York City in 1999. After winning an international design competition for the new civic offices of Kildare in Ireland in 2001, they moved their office to Dublin. Winning international design competitions is something this Irish architect and her team do very well. Whether they accomplish this through some magic lucky charms, or more likely, a rare combination of versatile creativity, compassionate vision, and remarkable skill in negotiating complex cultural, technical, and natural forces at some of the world's most significant building sites. They have been winning an extraordinary series of competitions and awards for 20 years. 
So these include the Grand Egyptian Museum near the pyramids in Giza, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Their design was selected as the winner in 2003 from among over 1,500 competition entries. And this mesmerizing and mammoth museum is now nearing completion. Award-winning competitions also include the Giant Causeways Visitor Centre on a dramatic uh, National Trust site in Northern Ireland, completed in 2005, and the Palestinian Museum in the West Bank, completed in 2016. Uh, the Palestinian Museum has been called a museum of hope and a safe place for unsafe ideas. A good mandate for any museum. Another competition winning work is the Canadian Canoe Museum in Peterborough, Ontario, part of Parks Canada's National Historic Trent Severn Waterway. Their 2016 proposal in partnership with Kearns Mancini Architects in will, be, will break ground hopefully soon. In all of their work, Hanahan Pang Architects takes a multidisciplinary approach to their projects of drastically different scales, from refining the interiors of Trinity College Dublin for visitors experiencing the exquisite ninth, ninth century Book of Kells, to reimagining the urban master plan for the Victoria and Albert Museum's Exhibition Road in London. Rogine not only wins competitions, but also serves on numerous competition juries, including Canada's 2018 Governor General Medals in Architecture. She has lectured and reviewed at numerous schools, including University College Dublin, where she earned a Bachelor of Arts, Harvard University, where she earned a Master's of Architecture, as well as MIT, Yale, and Cornell. Now, Rogine Keenahan, her work came to my, the foreground of my attention in 2014 when she was shortlisted for Woman of the Year Award by UK's Architects Journal. She's in good company with other celebrated Irish architects, such as Sheila O'Donnell of the O'Donnell and Toomey Architects, and Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara of Grafton Architects. And these women, among others, follow in the footsteps of trailblazing Irish architects like Eileen Gray, whose modern masterpieces influence Le Cabousier, and Marion Mahoney Griffin, an Irish-American architect who influenced Frank Lloyd Wright by creating over half the renderings in his famous 1910 Wasmuth portfolio. But of course, this is not a lecture on trailblazing Irish architects. Roisin Hanahan is here tonight because she and her team are producing some of the most important and best architecture in the world, much of which involves beautiful masonry. So please join me in welcoming Roisin Hanahan. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here tonight. So um, I'm going to go straight in. The, we call the lecture calibration. I can't decide if there should be two L's or not there, but anyway. And, and, and part of that is because I suppose we're interested in systems of measurement, but in particular, how it informs buildability and how we can find a way into developing an architectural language for our different places through trying to understand how we build there. So starting with the Egyptian Museum, which is a very, very large museum. It is over 100,000 square meters, so it's about a million square feet, on a 50 hectare site, about 130 acres, just beside the pyramids in Giza. So it was a competition. It was an open competition. And um, for the first stage, we hadn't seen the site, but we found this photo, just like as one does, going through the internet, and came across this photo. And what struck us was the proximity of Cairo to the pyramids, the way the city wraps the pyramids. The, it's just from one side where the desert still uh, is uh, allowed uh, a little bit of free reign around the pyramids. And in a way, I suppose the significance for us was the museum was very much about um, creating a space for pharaonic art, but, but a lot of it as well was dealing with tourism. And we were interested in seeing was there a way that we could make space for the people of West Cairo within the museum. Um, 
So this, of course, is an image of uh, North Africa, and uh, there's there's the Nile as it cuts through Egypt. Let's see, does this work? Well, you can see it here, of course. And for Egyptians, Egypt is really the space of the Nile, and and. They, they kept saying to us when we, after we won the competition, oh, you Westerners, you're all so kind of taken up with the desert. But for Egyptians, it's really about the Nile. And of, of course, that's also very much, like the landscape of Egypt is very much one of contrast. You've got the fertility of the Nile and then that of the desert. And it's, it's physically, you can see it. The, the Nile Valley is lower than the desert, um, and our site for the museum is right at that point where the desert meets the Nile. There's in fact a 50 meter difference in level across the site. So the pyramids, of course, are in the desert. That, that's the space of death. The Nile was the space of life. So when we, we came to the site, so we're very, very close there. You can see it's... Um, I'm not sure where the pointer is working here. Oh, there. So it's only two kilometers uh, from the site to the pyramids. So one of the things was, how are we going to put this very major museum so close to the pyramids? Um, so the first thing we did was, well, we decided that the museum would not go above the plateau, that we were going to keep the building between the top of the plateau, that's the desert and the Nile Valley. So. We, we created a new face for the plateau and took a line from the pyramid, from down past, and redefined that edge of the plateau. And then unfolded that line, taking the view to the pyramids, and that essentially became the, the space of the museum. Um, and then sectionally here, we also took the line across from the site back down, so the museum is actually sloping back down. Um, another thing that we were interested in was, was measurement. Uh, when we won the competition, we were taken around to the Egyptian Museum by one of the curators, and uh, he picked out this piece as being one of the most significant that he thought about Egyptian uh, civilization. Because the Egyptians standardized measurement across a whole lot of different uh, areas, it allowed them to develop a very efficient bureaucracy, which allowed them to uh, develop um, efficient means of taxation, which then, of course, gave the wealth that allowed um, the civilization to develop. So we found that a very interesting idea. So one of the um, elements of the brief was Nile Park, and that was part of the whole landscaping program in the brief. And again, going back to the idea of the Nile being this infrastructural space, it was, um, it, it was a major system of transportation. Um, and, and of course, for many people, it, it was really, it, it felt like that was the space of Egypt there. Um, so we decided to think about this Nile Park also as an infrastructural element, as a way of registering change across the site, but also as a way of creating a different way of looking at the site from the, that cone, if you like, that we had placed the museum in. So the Nile Park is laid across the site and it kind of creates a different way of experiencing the site, creating a different series of gardens. So if this, if this structure here, this radial structure, is where the museum is, then these outside spaces here, these parks, kind of cross over the site in a different way. And that becomes, uh, <clears throat> this, that becomes an amenity for the people of Giza and that, that west side of Cairo. And then the, the landscape is developed with primarily the green spaces in the lower area. So if this, the pyramids are down here, there is the valley. So this is the lower part of the site. The desert is up here. So in general, the green areas are in the Nile Valley, but one, one space is displaced up into the upper plateau, and I'll talk about that. Well, and, and that becomes the uh, lands of Idrit, which is a constructed garden that tells us other story um, about 
uh, about Egyptian civilization, one of the things that struck us was that when you walk through the museum, a lot of the pieces are from uh, tombs. So what we wanted to be able to do was to find a way to tell a story that spoke about the wealth of the civilization, that there's a, there's a, a lot of discussion about death in a way, or there's an association with death maybe, uh, in some ways, in uh, maybe in popular culture with it, that pharaonic civilization, and we thought that by having this this garden that spoke about the wealth of Egypt through its landscape, that it might be a way of bringing. That, that pharaonic civilization to life in some ways. So here you can see a model. Uh, you can see the level difference here a bit more clearly. So this is the, that uh, Nile Park as it cuts across the site. But here you can see that level difference. So we, of course, straightened out the line. Um, that very significant level difference across the site. And this is then a model with the roof off. So um, the pyramids are down here. This is the desert, so there's that line, and of course we've kind of constructed a new uh, line for the museum here. And with the roof on, so, um, so you can see that we're keeping below the plateau edge. And what we, we were of course interested in the monumentality of uh, Egyptian architecture. Um, and we wanted in some ways to capture that in the museum. So the entrance in the museum is this, um, is this huge ramp that brings you up to the stone wall and from there you go into the pyramid. So in a way we're not trying to, to make it this kind of small mediated space. We want people to feel the grandeur of the civilization. 4,000 years of uh, civilization, we want people to feel that as you come into the museum. When you come through the stone wall, you come into this courtyard, it's a shaded space and from there people begin the journey into the museum. So this is another view of that courtyard, this is, um, I don't know, if, if you recall, this statue was in Tahrir Square in Cairo and it's since been moved out to the museum. But this, in, in this place here we're actually in a courtyard space, it's a shaded space. So stepping back a bit, pyramids down here, this is the Cairo Alexandria Desert Road, here is the ramp that brings one up in through the stone wall into a courtyard space. So what looks like one building is actually two buildings. The stone facade is actually a screen wall and here's the museum, conference and education and back over here is conservation and an energy centre with tunnels bringing everything into the museum proper. Uh, and this is a view of the uh, courtyard space. Because the pyramids are up about 25 meters up from the level that the museum entrance is at, and we wanted, when people were in the galleries, we wanted people to have a view to the pyramids, that meant that we had to get people up to that level, to the permanent exhibition galleries. So, because of the, the number of people coming through, about, it's designed uh, for 5 million visitors a year, there's just a huge stair with a, a travelator to the side that brings people from the entrance up to the permanent exhibition galleries. And this is designed as, a, as an exhibition space, it's the Pharaoh's Gallery. So when you're here, you start with Cleopatra, 32 BC, and then start to go back in time so up the stair till you get to the top and from there you have a view of the uh, pyramids which are Old Kingdom and then you move into the gallery proper. So looking at it another way, pyramids down here, this is the entrance space, there is a conference centre. All of the exhibition galleries are, the permanent exhibition is on one floor. And um, the idea behind that was that we wanted people to be, have this sense at different times of that scale of that civilization. So it's, it's a very, very large floor. It is divided into zones, so it, it steps up. So the, the, the permanent exhibition steps up. So when you arrive, you're up here at the Old Kingdom, 
and then you get views at different time uh, at different areas back over these galleries. So you step back down around through Tutankhamun and then back out again. And then at the places where the floors step, these are the intermediate periods. The intermediate periods were times of disruption um, and also there wasn't as much produced. So these are some views of the galleries. The, the brief did call for daily galleries. Um, there's a lot of stone in the collection. And of course, it helps to reduce energy consumption. So looking in a bit more detail, this is actually the construction uh, drawing. And what you're seeing here is that these lines, the, the blue lines, are the original radial lines uh, as the... Um, as this cliff line unfolded to take in the view to the pyramids. But they're, they're the structural lines and they're also the servicing lines so that between the blue lines you have a completely clear span for the galleries. So what we're seeing he here, these stone walls, these are those, those structural walls that also contain all the services, fire stairs, so that all of that is tucked away and allows the space in between to be completely uh, clear for display. Um, well, developing an energy strategy that allowed the museum to be sustainable long term to operate was quite important. And so we, we looked to the idea of layering, to trying to so as, as, as you start, you don't walk in through a door and you're suddenly in an air-conditioned space, but you, you gradually move through zones of control, so it's gradually getting more controlled. So that first courtyard space, it's, it is outside, but it is shaded and there's water, so it, the temperature is taken down from when you're outside. As you ascend the stairs, you're still actually outside, but there is a system of cooling that's introduced as you start to move up. So that when you're at the top, you're now in a conditioned space and as you move into the main galleries, they are conditioned, but they're not the really, really close control that you need for the most uh, fragile elements and those are in microclimate generators. So what we're trying to do is to provide an appropriate level that also allows the museum to be operated um, w with, I suppose, uh, the most sustainable kind of energy profile that we could. The structure, of course, is concrete to make it as resilient as possible so that should the uh, power go out, that it would very, very slowly acclimatise. So this is a section through the stair. So the bottom of the stair, this is the, the uh, courtyard space, and what's been introduced into the stair are these glass screens. So cold air is released at the top of the stair and, and through the steps. So as people start to move up the stairs, it, you, you gradually feel it getting cooler and the glass screens actually hold back the warm air. So it's a way of trying to gradually bring the temperature down without actually uh, having a whole lot of air locks as people move up through. The, um, the structure itself is a concrete structure. There is a steel roof uh, over which provides uh, shading and also the stone wall is a screen wall also which takes some of the load off the building fabric. The, um, the stone of course is very important to the Egyptians. It was something that we were we wanted very much to use in the project. Um, so, uh, but the other thing that was important was that transition from day to night that is such a part of Egyptian culture. But I think also when you're in that region in the Middle East, the, that whole night culture where people come out because it's a lot cooler was also quite interesting for us. So the, the stone wall is designed as a screen wall that during the day looks like st um, um, solid stone, but at night it becomes um, backlit. It's uh, an onyx wall. And that actually required quite a lot of research to determine the appropriate size of the stone, the thickness of the stone to allow it to be backlit, and also uh, not, uh, to get a balance between the amount of steel versus the thickness of the stone. So 
the, just to give you some idea of the scale of the wall, there, oops, sorry, there is the Seattle uh, Library at the same scale. It is a very, very big building. Um, the, the, the building line actually stops here, and that's a screen that continues in front of the retaining wall. So we needed to develop a system that allowed it, this huge quantity of stone to be um, cut and managed in a fairly rational manner. So the wall is divided into these triangular elements. And each one of these is it's a freestanding screen. It's propped off the wall. So using a Sierpinski, Sierpinski gasket, it's divided. Basically, you join the midpoints of the triangle and you continue to subdivide. And what, what that gives you is uh, a system of division where all the triangles are the same uh, size. And, so, and it's also structurally very stable. So three-dimensionally, the steel is sized for the span. So these steels here are uh, thicker than these and so on as, as it goes down. Then this cable net structure introduced in the middle. But what that allowed us to do was to introduce a three-dimensionality into the wall that was based on its construction. Uh, it gave us a fair, a quite a rational way of managing the stone. We ended up for such a huge wall. We had 17 different stone sizes. Um, and it, it was all drawn from the way of making the wall. So this is the museum under construction. So th uh, this is taken from the south. So you can see some of these big structural walls as they come out. So uh, concrete walls, and that's the zone of services in between. You can see these large um, uh, roof spans across the galleries. This is inside that courtyard space. So you can see the, the, um, the statue of Ramses in place and the steel structure there for the stone wall, and also some of the shading structure overhead. So uh, standing here, the museum is to the left-hand side of the image the um, education gallery there to the right, and again that shading structure above. Um, this is uh, taken the other way. And this is looking down the stairs, so you can't really see how the stair is opening out there, partially because of the wall and also because of all of the, um, uh, the scaffolding. And a view from the top. So that this is the steel, um, the screen that's above it, above the roof. So I think the museum is going to open in 2020. And um, so that was a, a huge project. It um, it was a project that we were working on from 2003 to 2008, and. Um, uh, at the, um, when we were working on it, we did the uh, competition for the Giants Causeway Visitor Centre, which is, it could fit into one of the small galleries of the Egyptian Museum, it's 1800 square metres. The Giants Causeway is a World Heritage Site, and it's a World Heritage Site because of the geology. Um, th there's um, these uh, hexagonal columns of basalt. Um, Samuel Johnson said about it, it was worth seeing, but not worth going to see. <laughs> it, uh, it's important, though, because it's accessible. And of course, because it was accessible to British geologists um, at a time when the British Empire was so powerful, and there was a lot of study done uh, on this. So that's why it's a World Heritage Site. It was always very important for tourism. Um, it, it's on the north coast of Northern Ireland, and this formation covers quite a lot of the cliffside along Northern Ireland. The Giant's Causeway itself is one element of the cliff, and there's a lot of focus on it. People tend to get very disappointed when they get there because they're not looking at the cliff, they just look at the causeway. So the causeway is here. The visitor centre is over here, and so it's about a kilometre from the causeway. But really, I think what's interesting is the entire cliff formation. So everybody who gets there gets there by car or very few people get by bus. So we were very aware from the outset that uh, one of the things that was quite important 
was trying to um, organize how cars were going to get to the site. So what we decided was, so this is the site over here, there's the causeway, that we're going to make two cuts in the landscape. One comes out and one cuts in and in between there's a walk up to the cliff. So looking at it in place, there's the, the walk up to the cliff, there's the cut down which allows us to uh, conceal the car parking to some extent and there's the visitor centre itself as it comes out. And the reason this was so important was we really wanted to emphasise the importance of that cliff edge and actually getting up there and having a broader look over the landscape. And all of it is defined by, these, by this stone um, facade. We, were, we couldn't, of course, use the stone from the site because it's part of the World Heritage Site, it's all protected, but we were able to use basalt from the same lava flow that uh, created the causeway. So you can hardly see this here, but from the cliff edge, it, it kind of goes down and uh, it, it's not visible at all. So this is standing up the cliff and you can see there, there's this cut here that buses can drive through, but the building has been designed so that it moves down from that edge there. And then from the other side, it's a lot more visible because it's coming up. So uh, there's that walk up and this is the car park. And that's the view from the other side. So again, that, that definition, we were lucky to be able to uh, get the basalt to be able to use there. So the, so the site is organized by, the primary means of organization are these two cuts into the landscape. But we did need to pull together the site. And, and the car parking was very, very important. Uh, it was important that we organize it so that it not become too visually intrusive on the site. So we took these organizing lines across the site. They organize the car parking. And they also organize the roof lights as they come into the building. And then a secondary means of subdivision was pulled across, which started to organize the stone facade. So no matter what uh, the geometry of the cut was, the secondary means of organization was always maintained, which means that when you're standing in a certain location on the site, you can see across, right across the building because of the alignment. At other times, it appears a lot more solid. But coming to the stone, we, we did want to use the stone. However, the basalt in Northern Ireland is a stone that's very, um, has a lot of cracks in it. It's typically used as hardcore under roads and it, it's almost never, in fact it's never used as a building stone. So we carried out some tests. Uh, in compression it's very good, in tension it's very very weak. And in addition, we, so if you're looking at using a stone in compression, you would have the kind of ratios that the Doric column there is, uh, five to one, whereas we were looking at uh, much skinnier columns. We were looking at some being about 40 to one. So the question was, how are we going to do it? It, wa it wasn't a stone that we could cut very finely. We couldn't use it as a typical cladding stone. We absolutely had to stack it. So we worked with Arab and Tim McFarlane um, on this. So we developed a system of stacking the stones so that was fine, that was great um, for the compression. But then threaded them together with uh, steel rods to give, them, um, to give them that strength and tension as well. So this is the stone as it was uh, coming to the site. So he, these are the rods, the uh, uh, cuts for the rods. This is just to allow them to locate it. And then this is the installation of the stone itself. So, it was, we were very lucky that the National Trust was the client and they were, it was very important to them to, um, to find a way to use this material because I think if it had been a, a more commercial, the, the risk involved with the stone would have been a, a bit more of a challenge and the amount of stone that we had to take out of the ground to do this. So this is the, um, these are some photos of it in place. We did have to allow a lot of flexibility to the contractor. So what we did was we set these lines here 
control lines at 900 uh, millimeters. And then within, they could either uh, use 150 mil, 300 or 450. What that allowed them to do was, there's a, there was a lot of um, cracking in the boulders. And sometimes they just weren't able to get the bigger sizes of stone. So the fact that they were able to bring the subdivisions down to much uh, smaller sizes gave them uh, a lot less waste, which really made the project more achievable because the stone on this project was started on day one and it was finished two years later. It, it, was, um, it was quite a, a significant uh, operation. Uh, so here you, you can just about see that sometimes there are quite small pieces of stone in the vertical dimension where, where the strength of the boulders wasn't there. And then on the interior, because it's an outdoor site, nobody goes to the Giant's Causeway to go in, inside the visitor centre. This is really very much supporting the outdoor experience. But we wanted people to feel inside that outdoor quality, so the stone is carried in, uh, there's a concrete roof, and the, uh, we use basalt uh, chippings as an aggregate in the concrete, and then it's polished concrete, so you see that again there. Uh, and of course the other material is light. Um, so here, th these are some of the roof lights that were kind of organized in, in that earlier image. And another thing that was important to us was the structure, actually I'll go back here. So you can see here how rather than having concrete structures, that would, uh, columns that would kind of interrupt the line of the roof, we introduced steel elements, but then they become very closely coordinated with, um, with roof lights. In a way, of course, we wanted the vertical structure to go away as much as possible, so that really what you're reading is the roof and the floor. And, and then coming back up to the cliff side, w the building kind of turns around and looks back over the landscape because there's so much focus when people come to the causeway. They're always kind of just going to the causeway and just looking down at this one location. We hoped that the building would somehow help people to orient and, and take a broader look around them and look at the entire coast and the, that entire landscape. So kind of coming from two projects that were very much embedded into the ground um, we, uh, we we're also working on um, the Canadian Canoe Museum and for this one I suppose we were we were interested in the um, of course, in the canoe, it's canoe museum. But what was interesting about uh, the, the canoe for us was the way that its desi design um, is, you know, it, it works beautifully in the water, but it, it's light enough to car carry across the land. So it's, um, it, it has this kind of very specific specificity about what, what it's doing. And um, this, uh, the wood construction. We're also interested in the way this is, it's on the Trent Severn waterway, the way when the water kind of uh, unfolds across the landscape, if you like, it creates these spaces, a kind of wrap space, a carved space, so uh, our it defines space. So the site is beside the Peterborough lift lock and the Peterborough lift lock is, and I hope I get this right, is the largest mass concrete structure in the world, I think. Um, so our, the site for the museum is here and it's, uh, the lift lock is a big tourist uh, draw in Peterborough. It's also quite a significant piece to be beside. So when we started thinking about the project, I suppose the first thing we were thinking about was that we were beside this uh, site that was kind of associated with superlatives. It was the largest, so it had a lot of superlatives w with it and we were designing the museum. So if you like, the lift lock was the elephant and we, how, how are we going to coexist with it? So its presence is really in the vertical dimension. So it's, it's very impressive vertically. In plan, it's, it's of course, it's almost like a point in the ground because it's the point at which uh, the, high water, the, the high part of the canal meets this uh, lower part of the canal. And that started to get us thinking about 
compositions of high and low. So we say the, the tower and the plinth, that very classic modernist uh, piece, say the United Nations or the Guggenheim. So rather than thinking of the museum as a piece in itself, we started to think about the museum and the lift lock together. So if the lift lock is the tower, then the museum is the plinth. So it's going to occupy that horizontal dimension. And of course, the other thing was we were, this, the site is uh, in part of that whole park infrastructure that goes along the, uh, the canal. So how do you start making space in the landscape? Uh, this is a James Turrell piece in, uh, in Ireland. And what we're interested in was how the, the landscape makes space. So when you're in that, you're, you don't see anything outside of it. It completely shapes your view to the sky. Also, this, this, the way that curved elements start to define spaces on either side of them and start to shape space. Uh, this is a, a boat that was designed by uh, Alto and it was designed so that the underside actually generated ripple, uh, specific ripples in the water. So it's like who's shaping what? Is it, so kind of, is the building shaping the landscape or who's shaping, you know, what's the relationship between the two? So this is the museum site, there's the lift lock, there's the canal, museum site is located alongside here. So what we did is we took one of those contours and rippled it over the landscape to create the series of rooms. So that comes out from that level, comes straight across. So uh, one of the rooms is devoted to the lift lock, one to the canal, and one to the south, to this, um, to this field that opens out to the south and connects to the remainder of the, the park. So what we're trying to do is to, to take that facade that's facing the water and increase it, kind of create a longer facade that then looks to the water in different ways. Because it's a canoe museum, we thought it was so important that you're aware of the canal and the activities of the canal while you're inside of the museum. And then uh, that space between the museum and the water could become a space for events, for different activities. So in summer that it becomes this very busy space and the roof then creates this different way of viewing the water. Uh, so here uh, a, view, a view from the roof that you could have different kinds of events up here, maybe school groups, whereas this would be maybe more public, uh, well they're both public uh, publicly accessible, but these might be more events related to the water, whereas this could be more maybe teaching spaces or it's, it's a little more private up there. So the museum is organized uh, by this layering to the water. So the front space is, is a, a, a continuous public space, entrances here, coming downstairs, you actually enter in the mid-level uh, to the um, entrance to the galleries and then continuing on down to a uh, cafe and then there's a re reception space here. But this is one continuous open space that opens to a fully glazed wall looking out onto the water. So it's almost like a, a shop window to the museum and this becomes this uh, continuous space, is, uh, we, we want it very much to be a space of activities that then addresses the water. So inside it's a, a very simple glass wall that curves around, um, with the galleries are more controlled so they're in behind so this is kind of becomes a transition, tr uh, transitional space between the gallery and the space outside and of course also the possibility in winter for events along it but it, it just becomes this kind of simple space that mediates between the outside and the inside. So in section, at the top where it's closest to the lift lock, the building is entirely underground. Coming down, this is actually where the entrance is, it's at the mid-level, so people arrive from here, they come in and then drop down to the main gallery yeah. level, and then finally the building emerges out of the ground. So the organization is quite simple, it's primarily on one level with a mezzanine for entry. And then look here at the south end um, with the, uh, there's a reception space here looking to the south. This is the main space of the 
entrance which looks out to the water and then the galleries are located more along this edge here which looks to the lift lock. Um, in, in developing the landscape we worked with um, um, uh, a landscape architect who works locally and we were interested in developing the uh, landscape as an edible landscape, so as a productive landscape. Um, so, and, and that theme is getting developed in a lot more detail right now. Um, so, and, and the museum as well has a, um, it's a very active museum. The collection of course is very, very important, but it is an active museum. They have a lot of programs, um, they, a lot of school groups, but they bring the community in as well. So the space between the museum and the water is, um, has a lot of facilities to allow programming to be taken out so that it becomes quite an active space. Uh, well, during the summer and maybe year round. So the final project then is the Palestinian Museum. This is a, um, a museum in the West Bank. It's in, um, it's close to Ramallah, uh, Berzaitis University. And it's a museum hub. It, it's called a museum hub because the client was very aware that many pa Palestinians cannot um, get into the West Bank. So one of the things about this museum is it'll generate a lot of con content for other locations to have the exhibition. So I suppose, again, it was a competition. And, um, it's in the Palestinian hills, where the West Bank is mostly uh, this very, very hilly landscape. And one of the things that we were very taken by was this terraced landscape that, that it was terraced, of course, for farming. So these old agricultural terraces that really occupy many of the hills. So this is a quote uh, from Italo Calvino about the city, how it doesn't tell its past, but it contains it like the lines uh, of a hand written in the corners of the streets, um, the gratings of the window. And, and in a way, the West Bank, that landscape has that quality where its history is inscribed into the landscape because this is a very densely occupied landscape, I mean occupied in the sense of every area has in some way been touched because it's been, it's been very densely populated. So we were very interested in, in how we, I suppose, worked with the, um, what, what we found there on site. So the site had these old agricultural walls. It was no longer a farming site. It, it's now part of the university, but it had the remains of these old walls. And one of the things that was interesting about the walls was that where you have the difference in terrace, be, uh, the, the difference in level, because of the way the walls capture um, the water, you start to have all these plants that grow there. The other thing about the site was it was a west facing hill and uh, from that hill you can see to the Mediterranean. And of course, most people in the West Bank cannot get to the Mediterranean. This was uh, a video that was taken after the museum was opened. Yuan Ban uh, was photographing the museum. There was an installation of the sea with sand in the gallery floor for children who had never seen the Mediterranean. So for us, that, that view to the Mediterranean was really important, that it become something that would be an important element in the project. And this is the first phase. The, uh, the Taiwan, who is the, uh, the client, wanted to test the museum. They wanted to see uh, what worked, what didn't work. So, uh, so this is kind of establishing a base and then we had to allow for a second phase. So 
you know, typically if you're doing a master plan, you put a grid over it in some way, but of course this is a hilly site, and there was that west facing, and west, by the way, is here, north is up at the top. So what we decided to do was, was of course, use the contours, so drawing lines across uh, the site using those contours, and then transforming those lines with these control points, which allowed us to adjust to the contours, but also gave us the flexibility, rather than being locked into an absolute fixed grid, allowed us to move things around as we found things, or maybe as a program needed to adjust. So it gave us quite a lot of flexibility in the overall master plan. One of the key decisions was, where do we build the first phase? In some ways, it would have been easier to build down and move back up the hill. But because this is the first Palestinian museum, there are other museums in the West Bank, but this is the first Palestinian museum, we felt that it was very important that it have a strong presence, and therefore that it should be built at the top of the hill, that it create the crown of the hill, and then start to move down subsequent phases to move down the terraces. And of course, we wanted it organized around the view to the west, um, which in its turn uh, created a lot of other problems for us because uh, we, we then had the large windows facing the west facing sun, where we are getting most solar built up, but I'll come back to that a bit later. So this is the organization of the site. So you can see, uh, so it's beside Birzeit University. Birzeit is one of the big universities in the West Bank. So it, of course, follows the contours. And it, it, that's what everybody here does. So, uh, so we're kind of on the next loop out, and there's the museum itself. So sectionally, um, the building in general is on one floor. And then as we got more detailed site information, we found some uh, some uh, hollows in the landscape, so we were able to put in a second floor for education and also create an amphitheatre. The view, the, the, the best view is to the west, however the wind is also coming in from the west. And of course we've got that sun, so in the evenings uh, that wind can become quite strong, so having this ability to have uh, a little bit of enclosure for the amphitheatre also had its benefits. The plan is fairly simple. It's a central entrance, uh, offices to one side and the gallery to the south and then below this gallery there's um, a stair that leads down to the lower level, education and then there's um, the amphitheatre here. So there's quite a lot of administration here because it is, it is this first phase and um, they're generating a lot of content for other locations. And the building, is, so you can see here in section, the building is generally on one level, it drops down there to the lower level. There's also an axis in here from the back. In terms of its profile, we wanted it to have a very distinctive profile on the hill. So it has this sculpted profile to kind of create a crown to the hill. So the site is about four hectares and we, we wanted to develop the landscape because it gave us a, a, a certain number of benefits. I suppose one was that when we were on site during the competition, we were with their, uh, there with some uh, architects and some people from the university, and we found there was this uh, wild time, and they started talking about. Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, he was collecting it and uh, saying he was going to uh, do some cooking with it and they started talking about different dishes and then they started talking about different um, uh, associate, uh, you know, festivals and feasts and w we started to realise that, that through what grew on the site there was an ability to start to uh, talk about different foods, different traditions and it was a way to start, I suppose, talking about Palestinian culture through, through what, uh, what grew there and the associations with that place. So, we worked with a landscape architect in, in Jordan, Lara Zurichat, and 
developed this kind of idea about, about what actually grows in the West Bank. So the landscape has been informed, or I, sh I should say maybe the uh, agriculture has been informed by what's natural, but also what has come in, what's been cultivated, because that area is a, a real meeting, uh, a, a real crossroads. So the natural land, so it moves from the natural landscape to the cultivated landscape. So for example, the citrus is very, um, is very associated with that region, but that actually came in from Asia. And through looking at the associations between those different foods, you could start to tell a narrative about that place. So closest to the building is where we have the uh, cultivated landscape. So starting with the home orchard, there's pomegranate, fig, grape. And then we thought that the, the cafe could start to develop a menu that's seasonal, that uh, draws in some of those dishes. Uh, mal uh, uh, pomegranate, molasses, figs, and so on, the orange, the mulberry. And then the next, moving down, there was a field orchard, so you have the olive, the carob, and then from that, olive oil, again, molasses, nuts, moving down to the medicinal orchard, ca chamomile, the various teas, spearmint, and moving down to the forestry, uh, with the, now we're getting more into the, the natural landscape, uh, the oak, the pine, then finally down to the picnic grasses. This is one thing that Lara was uh, telling us, that when, the, when spring comes around, the first rains, the grasses start to bloom very quickly, a lot of families uh, go out and have picnics, so that's something that's very specific to that area, and then coming down to the scrubland. So the site is layered in that way. It, the, the, that kind of extensive landscape wasn't really part of the brief, but the client really saw the value of it. There was a way, I suppose, to tell a narrative in one way, but it was also a way to extend the space of the museum. The museum, because it's kind of testing things, is not so large, and there was a desire not to build huge interior area, uh, but outside space, especially in that climate, um, you know, can be very easily programmed and um, it's also a way to bring people in who might not be so comfortable or maybe interested in the museum but might want to walk through the gardens. So it was a way to kind of expand the space of the museum without necessarily building a huge museum. So this is when, so the, the construction of the garden started at the same time as the construction of the museum. And this was the first stone walls being put in place. Now we did want our intervention to be quite, um, to be, I suppose, to distinguish itself because in a way it's quite contrived. It's, it's us interpreting, so we didn't want to just take over these field stone walls. We did actually shape this with, with our own geometry. So that's it under construction and it, so here you can see the finish. Now one of the things that I always find interesting about these high level images, it always looks very brown, but when actually you get down it's a lot more lush. So we, I call this defining the intersections, but it's really about how we built the museum. So again, we were very interested in using stone. This, is, uh, this region is a, a very much is a stone region. Um, Jerusalem stone, what's called Jerusalem stone, uh, comes from this area. This is, um, this is a stone yard in Bethlehem. So we really wanted to use stone. It also, the heaviness of the, the structure suits the climate because we um, want to have a very well insulated envelope and, and people are very familiar with using it. But we also wanted the, st we wanted the building to have in a way almost this very uh, monumental form. It's not a very big building but we wanted to have a monumental form and therefore that the stone should wrap around the building so over the top and continue down all of the facades. So the structure is concrete, uh, again it's something that like in Egypt people are very familiar with concrete construction, it works very well in that climate thermally, it's very good but we needed to use the concrete uh, to, uh, as a heat sink uh, for the galleries to help stabilise the galleries. So this is a photo of the formwork 
for the roof. And this was really quite challenging for the, the contractors because it's a place where buildings tend to be square. These kind of complex geometries were, uh, were a challenge, but they, I have to say they really rose to it. And this is the, um, after the roof form was cast, it was cast with upstand beams. We wanted to have clear, um, a clear soffit underneath. Uh, we needed the large beams in order to get the spans across the gallery. And you can see there the folds in the roof. Um, so, but this is the quality of the concrete when you get in close. So in a way, it's this funny thing that's happening between these quite precise geometries and the material that we're building with is, is, is like this. So the, the stone itself is very commonly used in the area, but it's typically, it's just kind of applied to the wall and it, the, none of the buildings are insulated. We did need to insulate this building. The, the museum wanted to have an Ashra A gallery, so they want a very high performing gallery. And as well, in terms of energy use, it, it had to be insulated. So what we were hoping to achieve was this kind of alignment. So all of the joints to wrap over. So three dimensionally, that was quite complex um, to get all of those stone joints to align. And the other thing for the contractor, and I suppose what, what has to be remembered is that typically what happens is you've got a concrete wall, you've got pla uh, plaster, or a, and then the stone is just put straight onto this. But because we needed to insulate, there needed to be a steel structure. There is only one other building in the West Bank that has this, uh, this you know, putting the stone on steel. And because of the alignment of the joints, all of these steel rails had to be uh, well, first of all, the stone jointing had to be figured out and all the stone sizes and then the steel rails had to be all set out three-dimensionally by the contractor. And this is something that just people have never done there. So th the contractor was great. They did the three-dimensional model. They figured it all out. And th this, in a place, you know, wh where this just doesn't happen. Uh, and, and they really took it on. It was great to see. So uh, this is, when we started this, we were told, you're crazy. You, you know, you shouldn't try to do this. It will never work. You have to figure out another way of doing it. But um, this is it under construction. So you can see there that the insulation, you can see some of the upstand beams and the, the steel supporting structure for the stone. And then you can see, in general, the joints align. There's one or two places where they don't, but uh, in general it worked out pretty well. So this is kind of stepping back a bit. You can see there are some openings there because we did have some ventilation up through the roof. And, and it's kind of this funny um, uh, mix. Where you can see the scaffolding system is kind of quite basic. And then you've got this kind of quite uh, finely engineered roof. But I have to say, um, stone masonry in that area is very, very good. Uh, and this is just a nice photo of all the st uh, stone connections, which we kind of liked. The other thing that was um, quite uh, an issue for us was west-facing facade. So this building is lead gold. Um, it's, I think it's the first lead gold building in the, in the West Bank. But as I'm sure you all know, that in order to achieve a lead gold, it's not just about the design, but it's also the construction stage. So for the construction team, this was kind of a different, completely different way of doing things. Um, so the issue for us was we wanted to have views here and we have a gallery with west facing sun and we didn't want to just keep pumping in energy to maintain these, uh, these, this temperature. So the first thing was that we decided to break the gallery into two sections. So there's this front section here, which is a buffer zone, and then the, there's a m much more controlled part of the, the gallery, which is in behind the wall. So this front area serves as a, an area maybe which has less stability. It can be used for a stone. It can be used for items that don't require that very, very close control. But it also gave us that buffer zone. So you can see here that you've got this buffer zone and then the very close control gallery is in behind that area there. 
Uh, this is another view of it. And then the other element that was, so we couldn't in a way introduce traditional, uh, like easy shading because we, we wanted to maintain these views. So what we did instead is we have a series of vertical fins and they get deeper as the glass gets higher. So the stone moves, or the glass goes back. So where it's highest, the glass is deepest and then the glass moves back out. So that's all. So the glass is not in the same plane as the stone. It's moving out. And that meant that at this point here, of course, we have most shade where we needed it. and We didn't need it so much here. So it, it moves back out again. The, the, the steel came from Dubai. It was, um, it was an interesting process. Um, there, this is some of the steel in the shop. This is one of the... Uh, visits for the, uh, it, it was uh, uh, checking working drawings and samples. And then this is the other side of the building. So since we had those very, very large windows on the west side, we really had to close down the building every other place, which wasn't so much a problem for the gallery. And surprisingly, there are the office windows. They look very small, but actually, because it's, it's very bright there, it, they get good daylight and then there's one big opening here that leads you into the building. So this is from the eastern side. Uh, water, of course, was a big issue for us. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's a big issue in the West Bank. There is a huge tank. We, we collect uh, all of the rainfall. There's a huge tank under this terrace here that takes the water so you can see it there. So it was about trying to integrate all of these elements uh, into the landscape, the, or not into the landscape, into the design. And of course, the landscape has been designed so that it has some irrigation for the first two years, but then hopefully we'll be able to reduce a lot of the irrigation. And even though we were originally targeting silver because we thought that's all we could get, we, it, it, the project ended up getting elite gold. So there's the client and the museum director. So uh, we were quite pleased about that. In terms of the landscape, the, the idea behind the landscape is that it, um, it reflects the season. So sometimes when you go there, there isn't so much to see. And then gradually, um, uh, you know, coming into spring and then going into summer, there are changes. The museum have kind of taken that on board very much and they organize events around uh, different seasons, uh, sometimes uh, picking olives, various events. Um, so they're trying to, to create as well, I suppose, some association between where some of the holidays and festivals have come from and their association back into what grew in that place. So one of the things that we discovered about the terraces was that uh, when they were being tilled originally, that it was more efficient to uh, do it with a horse and plough um, because it wasn't, wasn't so easy to get a tractor or, uh, onto them. So these are some of um, those trees at, at an early stage. At the edge of the site, there isn't a fence. <clears throat> so there's this um, sway to control rainwater. We ended up having to put a small fence because there were some wild boars who liked all the plants. Um, the um, people ha often ask us what it was like to work there. Um, were there any difficulties? We didn't have that many difficulties in truth. I suppose the, m the most difficult thing was that Lara, who was our landscape architect, she couldn't get a visa to, um, to visit the site. So all of the landscape approvals had to be done by, um, by uh, sending her these cuts and a lot of FaceTime and Skype calls on site. So, you know, taking photographs. And sometimes she would send somebody who had a French passport who uh, found it easier to get in. Um, so there you can see. So this is the, so to arrive in, you come up here. Parking is here at the back, and then entrance in at the central point, and then out, and there's uh, the gardens. As I said, the, the museum really took on the whole idea of the landscape, and um, 
for opening developed this um, this guide to the landscape and all of the plants, information about the plants, so that it also becomes a resource for um, for people in the West Bank uh, working with the university. So it's quite good that there there is that connection with the university that it it can kind of help to develop maybe more knowledge uh, about some of this um, this landscape. And um, this is this is the, the site plan here. So you can see here this is the the natural landscape. It's probably not so easy to see, but really that idea did very much uh, get continued into the final implementation of the scheme. So there are two ways, maybe two, uh, two major ways of navigating the garden. There is this slow route, which kind of crosses over and back. Oops, sorry. So it's quite a long route through the gardens. The gardens aren't really that big, but it can take you a while to walk through them. So we were trying to almost take that Japanese garden idea of by lengthening the path, you lengthen the experience of being in the gardens. And that's also the accessible route through the garden. Or there is this very fast route that you can quickly get up and down. So this slow route kind of meanders and it, it's about three times the length. And that's where you actually go through all of the various terraces and you see all the layers of the garden. And then where it falls, uh, there are these kind of meeting points where uh, this is a class from the university. So the university use, uses it quite a lot. And then looking back over the landscape, and I have to say the museum have really taken it on. For their first exhibition, they commissioned, I think, 40 artists to put pieces in the garden. Their opening was in the garden. So this is that amphitheater. Um, there is the, the classrooms there at a lower level. And again, this is a uh, this is another one of these folding areas. So, you know, it's kind of a place where a class can meet. Um, the terrace on the upper level, they use for, um, so this was um, like a community fair, p uh, putting out, yeah, just, just some, ten, you know, some uh, marquees there and y you can invite people in. So it, I think what it does is it completely expands the space of the museum and then it can kind of close down again. So you can have a lot of people in or then on a normal day it kind of becomes uh, maybe a more traditional museum. Some classes coming, coming there and th these are some of the pieces that were commissioned for the first exhibition. Um, there's another one of them over there and I think some of them have been removed now. One of the things that we found really interesting was that for the opening they invited a dance group to uh, perform there and I think that they probably suggested, they had to look around and they suggested that this buffer space, which for us was the buffer space to the gallery, would become their performance space and we were all sitting outside in the amphitheatre. So this is one of the rehearsals for it. And then this is the actual performance. So we were all outside and they were performing inside. It was, uh, it was really quite amazing. But what was really interesting was, it was something we had never expected. But it was interesting when people came in and how they could find space in the museum. So this is also a, a photo from the opening. And uh, this here was a natural rock formation, which of course didn't show up in many of the surveys. But when we started looking at it, we thought this point is taking that out. So we reconfigured the contours and left the rock formation there. And at the opening, they had um, an ensemble perform there. So again, it was kind of, there was a real pleasure in kind of finding all those spaces. And that's it. Thank you very much. is about your preliminary design strategy in approaching competitions. Is it correct that all, all four of these projects, they came from competition entries? Yes. Um, so the results are so synthetically integrated with the place, with the setting, the geology, the geography, the culture, right? The time, what grows there. 
this doesn't happen accidentally. Do, I guess I'm wondering how you balance your research into the place and then your tools as an architect, designer, team of architects that goes there with, with your I design ideas. How do you negotiate those ideas with the understanding of the place? Um, I think, I suppose with some of them, well, you're looking at what has been the outcome of many years of work after the competition. So I think where we're most successful is where the competition strategy is maybe touches on something that w allows us to develop it in more detail later on. So if we were looking with the Palestinian Museum that during the competition the client wanted to have some discussion with us and actually the Canadian Canoe Museum as well. They wanted to uh, meet us and we also got some insight about what was very important for them. So for example, with the Palestinian Museum, um, we started talking about the landscape and we are also very interested in the landscape and I suppose how space outside can help expand the space of, especially something like a museum, which can be a very internal experience. Um, so, I think they encouraged that direction, but they also uh, they had some ideas about the landscape architect. So they introduced us to Lara, and that was th that was a really great collaboration um, f for us in that she was able to open up a world that we would not have thought about. So it was also we needed to be quite open to that, and it also worked well, I suppose, with what we were thinking, but. I would say that project became much richer the more it get, got developed. Uh, if I were to show you maybe the pure competition, it wouldn't have all of that richness that it had at the end. And I think, um, so, yeah, so I think there's maybe, there's just maybe a, a little bit of a, a careful reading of the brief to try to have a strategy from the outset that has the possibility to be developed. Thank you. This one. How do you seal a stone roof? It, it's not. It's a rain screen. Okay. So <laughs> it's uh, the actual roof, the roof membrane is underneath. Okay. We had. Yeah, no, it, it's a rain screen. So that was one of the things that, as it comes down, there is no uh, mastic on the on the roof, and then as as it comes into the wall, that's when the mastic is introduced. But because the joint is so fine, uh, you don't really perceive it. That was one thing we were a bit worried about, and we we, uh, we also select the mastic so that it would have a bit of a shadow, so that it's kind of close to the fact that there's no none in the roof. Other questions, technical, detailed questions from our masonry friends or otherwise from students? I can ask one other question. As a firm who does many competitions and in a way, um, if I'm correct, initiated practice, I, I think there's also a handful of competitions which you did not win. Oh gosh, a lot more than a handful. <laughs> a lot more than a handful. Can you say something about the role of those competition entries which are not won, the role they play in the creative practice of the, of the firm? Well, of course, we learn from them. So, um, I, I, I mean, at each point, you're, we're either learning, um, when we see what won, uh, uh, some of the time it might be, oh, you must be kidding, and other times it's like, that was a really good idea, you know, and we start to see the mistakes we ourselves are making. I'd say that what maybe the, the thing that 
we always need to remind ourselves is that usually it's some form of an urban or a broader strategy that wins a competition. That, uh, that the context is always so important so that we might lose sight of it and just get totally caught up in the building, but most of the time, uh, the thing that's most important in is the response to sight. And um, yeah, that's something that we do need to keep reminding ourselves of. So, and of course, you know, we develop certain ideas that come back in other projects that might then win another competition. So, you know, you might get to use it someplace else. All right, Ivan, was that almost a question? No. <laughs> All right, Roisin, thank you very much. Thank you.